the smell of coffee wafts through the air, it can mean only one thing. Mr. Dawes is back, and our piece is over. This is Partners in Crime with Adam Croft and Robert Dawes. Oh. Oh. Hello. <laughs> How are you? You're right. Yes, I'm fine, thanks. Sipping the uh, the coffee. It's uh, it was starting to feel a bit lonely down there in that kitchen. The the coffee was going unused. The jar had almost sealed itself shut. You started recording. I have started recording. <laughs> oh yes. for goodness' sake! Um, <laughs> this is the BBC Home Service broadcasting live from Alexander Palace. I, if I'd known, I would I wouldn't have been sort of idling on mic. Oh, oh, there you go. It's yeah, um, a rule to anyone doing a podcast: never <laughs> idle on mic. It's um, it's a little insight into what happens here when the microphones are off, or when you think the microphones are off. Well, I'm standing. You're standing in front of the, you know, the. You're on the bridge, as I call it here in the <laughs> studio. Um, you're talking to me, and I suddenly see all these squiggly bits in red going up. Before I thought, what is that? What, what, what was the giveaway? Was it because I started doing my radio voice? Uh, you got very posh very quickly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, you've enjoyed a couple of weeks away, haven't you? You've. Um... Well, yes. It's been a it's been a busman's, but um, uh, it's been a fun time. Really, I've lots of different things happened. I've finished uh, my book. I've finished the Killing Rock, which was great uh, to, to to have that finished. Uh, it's an interesting thing. I was going to talk to you about that. When you're coming to the end of writing a book, it's very much that feeling when you're coming to the end of reading a book with mm. one particular difference in my case is that you don't quite want to leave it now when you're reading a book you don't want to stop it because you've, you're in the world and you're having such a wonderful read and you go oh it's going to end it's going to end soon and I don't want to be I don't want to leave this world I don't want to leave these characters and in that respect when you're finishing writing a book it feels exactly the same the only For you, maybe. Well, well, exactly. I mean, the only <laughs> difference is when you're reading a book, you know it's a good book because you're reading it. Yeah. When you've written a book, that question isn't answered. You're hoping that it's mm -hmm. a good book, but you're still going to leave uh, places and characters that you've spent, well, in this case, you know, a, a, a year with. Mm. Um, and if it's a returning series, you know, you know these characters over several years and, and places, so you feel very, very attached. So what I'm saying is that the um, elation of completing a novel uh, is balanced by the simple fact that you're going right. Um, I'm I'm saying goodbye to these mm. these people for a little mm. while, and they've been inside your head every day, mm. and sometimes in the middle of the night for several hours. When you suddenly get that eureka inspiration moment, uh, and reach for the pad in the dark, I uh, usually can't wait to get the things over with. Oh really? Oh, <laughs> by I'm, the time I've got towards the end, I'm thinking, oh, oh. I guess. Well, I didn't feel that. I felt, oh, right, here we go. Um, I mean, I enjoy it. Don't get yeah. me wrong, but um, I think because my the way my mind works, I'm always thinking of the next thing and the next thing and the next thing and normally when I'm writing a book I'm thinking about how it's going to impact you know one two five books down the oh, series right. and I'll start thinking about those you know what it's like when you get a new idea yes. all of the existing ideas suddenly just go right freeze those the new one's best so maybe it's a bit of that I don't know well that's true and it's well it's also because you're a far more organized man than I, I <laughs> have am. you seen the state of my desk well, well, I have but I mean it's you should see my study uh, <laughs> but I mean you're working on a, on many different books at the same time it's all I can mm. do to 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 do one, but anyway, so that that's part of of the thing. And then I've also just got back from the Gibraltar, the Jibanko uh, 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 Gibraltar Literary Festival, uh, which was fantastic. Had a wonderful time over in Gibraltar. And you call it work? Uh, well, I have to say they do look after you particularly well. It is a wonderfully run. Uh, uh, festival and unlike a lot of the crime festivals that you and I go to, uh, which are crime fests, uh, that's the only genre uh, being talked about. Um, the Gibraltar Literary Festival it draws from all forms of literature. I mean, there were people like Hugo Vickers and historians like Bethany Hughes and Johnny Ball was there. <laughs> uh, all sorts of things. We had Sheila Hancock talking about her book and her new film and all the rest of it. But it was it's fantastic. And so it's very eclectic um, and there are lots of very, very, very interesting people there. But the festival itself is beautifully run. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, by uh, uh, the uh, the people over there who are very welcoming. Uh, you have a big opening dinner cooked by Matt Tebbett, uh, who did a splendid job at the Coletta Hotel, I have to say. And so I did that and talked about my books. I did a show about P.G. Woodhouse, which was uh, lovely to do, and finished on the Sunday with Just a Minute, 
<laughs> Nicholas Parsons at 95 years of yes. age. See, when, when is that here? Is that, is that being... uh, I don't know. And oh, uh, Sheila Hancock, who's an old uh, veteran, yeah. and Jan Ravens, uh, and Felix Francis, who's been oh, on, yeah, on, yeah. on this show. So um, uh, we did two of those, which was lovely, and then a back in, into the back of a car and to the airport, and a very long journey home, because that's the only thing about Gibraltar sometimes. If the, we- the wind is blowing from the wrong direction, if it's blowing from the south, it tends to bisect the rock, which means uh, taking off or landing is quite difficult. Is that the way, when you have to come round that way, which means you, you can't fly through Spanish airspace on the way, and you have to come around and do a really tight turn you at last can't, minute? Yes, you can't yeah. fly through Spanish air, airspace yeah. uh, anyway, so you, you usually flying down from the UK oh, it's full of crime, this conversation it is, but if it? you're finding yourself heading south to the sun, this is the way to go if you're flying your own plane. You tend to fly over Malaga, take a right, fly out into the, the Med and, <laughs> and, and come round. Depending on <laughs> that, that's, that's how pilots describe it, Head for Malaga and turn right. Yeah, absolutely. And do, <laughs> all do, the terminology. do a quick swizzle when you get to the rock and, <laughs> and, and, and land the thing without ditching in the sea because it's a very short uh, it's a very short runway. So anyway, so I'm back from there, uh, which was a splendid time. So thank you, Gibraltar. Mm. Um, yes, uh, it's a shame they didn't keep him for longer, but uh, <laughs> I bet you're, uh, you're glad to see the back of that weather too. Well, the weather was, uh, yeah. I mean, whenever I've been to Gibraltar, the many, many times I've been before, I mean, one thing you can pretty much guarantee is 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 sunshine and warmth. Well, it was still warm, but occasionally you get a, a cloud that hangs around, and there were storms down there. And it was very dramatic um, uh, and, and very different. And I was glad from a writing point of view, because mm. I set my books in Gibraltar, that I'd actually seen uh, after all these years of going to Gibraltar, I'd never, I'd never managed to go there on a cloudy day. So uh, it was hard life, isn't it? Yeah, oh, it is. It is tough, but they, it was uh, very interesting. It's a dramatic place, and people mm. say, "Oh, I, I, I've never been." I, I'm not sure. Some people say I, I went years ago, and I, I, I wasn't sure. And other people just fall in love with it. There's a, there's a, it's changed so much over 25 years, mm. and I would say anyone. Uh, visiting, uh, having the choice to visit or not visit the rock, I'd say always go because you'll always get a wonderful, warm welcome. Um, it's got a great atmosphere and there's so much history there. If you're a history person, then it's made for you. Layer deep with historic stories and, and what have you. You know, it is among many other things where uh, the dead body of Lord Admiral Nelson was taken mm-hmm. from the Battle of Trafalgar and to preserve his body, he was put in a barrel of brandy. There you go. That's all, that's what I want to happen to me. Not many people know this. Well, no, no, yes, but you've got to be dead before that happens. Oh, right, that's, right. That's, 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 that's the downside. Thing, so I wouldn't wish that on you. But. No. Well, let, let's hope we can still go there after March. Uh, well, yes, there are other problems. Anyway, uh, steering away from politics very quickly. Um, I have been reading this book, the... Uh, this book? Yes, I have been reading this book. Well, I was going to say, I've been reading this week the new book by um, by R. C. Bridgestock, um, oh. which I'm just going to shamelessly I check the title of now because, um, I, I, well, I'll explain. It's uh, an advanced copy that their publisher sent to me, and um, I've been uh, reading through that, and it is absolutely brilliant. I've um, very much enjoyed that. We'll have to get them on the show to talk about their, well, their then, new book when yes, that comes we, out. The, the time is coming up for some more Bridgestock it is, input yes. on, on crimes, isn't it? Yeah. Poetic Justice is the title Poetic of it. Justice, yes. Yes. comes out at the end of February, um, and it's a fantastic read. It gets, uh, gets straight into things, it pulls you along, and I'm very, very much enjoying that. Oh, they are a, they're a phenomenon, aren't they, R.C. Bridgestock? Yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, apart from being such lovely people, uh, as listeners to the podcast were, would have heard when we uh, interviewed them earlier in the year, uh, they are prolific on many mm. different angles. Not only their wonderful books, but also their consultancy. Uh, they are called upon um, to consult on lots of television programmes, including Happy Valley and, and various others, uh, bringing um, their expertise uh, to uh, the screen to make sure that procedures are carried out, that, mm. uh, that not too much artistic licence is, is taken, or if there is, um, it's viable. Um, it's extraordinary. And, uh, and so what's the name of the new book? Poetic, um, Poetic Justice. Justice. Poetic yes. Justice. Now it's the end of February. And you've got an advanced copy. I have, and I can tell you now, it is superb. Um, and I'm not just saying that because they said they would put my feedback on the front cover. Oh, <laughs> I'm saying that because it is superb. So this, the de- jealousy doesn't exist between us, but sometimes just occasionally a slight pang. <laughs> 
Well, talk about jealousy. Um, I'm seeing the news here that um, Michael Connolly has been honoured with the Diamond Dagger from the uh, Crime Writers Association. That is, um, I believe, the, the highest accolade yes, that you... can be offered in, in crime writing. So yeah, it, um, is, it, is the, it is the top. It is the it Lifetime is. Achievement Award. Yes, the crate of Harry Bosch. He sold more than 60 million novels worldwide. That's, one, that's one or two, isn't it? Well, it's about three more than you. It, <laughs> <laughs> he... Um, and he's written now 31 novels. And, uh, yeah, so congratulations to him for his uh, Diamond Dagger, the highest accolade that can be given in crime fiction. So, um, yeah, one thing I did want to bring up with you, actually, not strictly crime-related, but I thought we probably should mention, um, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. Now, this is a, a programme which I believe is shown worldwide. Each country has its own variant, doesn't it? Oh, really? I, Do I they believe, use that jungle it? year round? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, right. yeah. So the, the, I mean, it might have different names, but basically, if in the country you're listening to, you have a show in which for a few weeks a year, some celebrities from your country are sent out to the jungle somewhere and uh, are told to live there and do trials and all sorts of things and eat bits of kangaroo, then um, this is basically <laughs> the, the show that we're talking about. The reason we're talking about it, um, and a large number of our listeners are in the UK, is that um, your niece is on it this year. Yes, yes, she, she certainly is. The lovely uh, Emily is out there, and every night we are glued to the set with our hearts in our mouths. Um, <laughs> well, she's got a kangaroo's testicle in hers. Well, I hope not. <laughs> I mean, she, I have to say, she's been very brave. They've all been very brave. I mean, it's a, you know, it's it's the show that we, when you've got children uh, at the age that I have, uh, and so that they've followed this show for for several years, and it's mm. our lead up to Christmas, yeah. um, I guess, and uh, and it's it, it it's a format that works mm. you know love it or hate it you talk to some people and they go oh I can't watch that sort of stuff and you talk to other people and they're absolutely glued but if you're looking for good television it's a great format um, you know, it, I was one of those people who thought oh no why would I want to watch that but um, I came across it accidentally a couple of years back it was on after something I was watching and I just got glued to it and you know it's not the case that it's you know 10 has-beens or whatever you know these are largely people on the, in the ascendancy of their yes. careers, and um, and and some very well known people, and I saw the lineup this year because I watched it the last couple of years, and I thought, oh, that's a good lineup. We've got John Barrowman, H- Harry Redknapp, you know, some some big names and people that I'm interested in, and then I saw Emily, and I thought, oh, well, I'm definitely watching that then. Well, I mean, she was um, she was very nervous about it, I have to say. And I can understand her apprehension, mm. um, uh, anyone's apprehension going out there, because you really have some idea of what might come your way. But of course, you know, actually being there and doing it uh, is is something it's completely different. It's a huge different thing to, to do, though. It's one of the biggest things you can do in British TV. Well, I n- knew before she went, and uh, that she said. Um, she was obviously interviewed and various other things about certain things that she liked and she didn't like. And she said, I haven't told them I don't like heights and I haven't told them I don't <laughs> like snakes because if you tell them that, that's the first thing they'll yeah. make you do. And, of course, the first thing they did when she got out there yeah. was pushed her out of a plane and then stuck her down a, a viper pit. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> and she got bitten twice. So you did you did uh, um, pass that tip off onto the producers then? Uh, <laughs> no, I wonder if someone did that. Uh, yeah. It certainly wasn't from our department, but, it's it, you know, it's it's... it's it's lovely to, to to see her. She's she's done so well. It's very hard. These programs they really do reveal things about people. I think, and uh, one of the things about seeing Emily out there is that's the Emily I know, mm. uh, and we all we, we all know and love. You know what you see is what you get, mm. and uh, oh, she's an actress and various other things. She's an impressionist. I mean, she I think that's a, a huge talent that she she does have. Um, Wonder where she gets that from. Well, she gets that from her mum Kate, who was <laughs> you know is also a, a terrific uh, a terrific mimic, but uh, she seems to be enjoying herself mm. that's the main thing and she has um, a, a very positive um, sunny disposition yeah. and uh, and if that continues to come through and, and and she hasn't got too many appalling obstacles thrown at her but there seems to be a sense of of, of in, in, watching the show over a few years there's a sense of bonding that goes on in the show now yeah, that yeah. I, I don't recall uh, happened in the, the, the bits I used to catch in the old days. There used to be an awful lot of sort of very uh, characters rubbing up against each other. It's not too late for it to happen. I guess this, this year, but there is a sense of bon- uh, bonding and camaraderie mm. that uh, t- takes place now on the whole, and everyone seems to look after each other uh, as they go through this this obstacle course of psychological and physical um, uh, abuse, all in the name of entertainment. But she's coming across so well. And what I really loved is that in the first trial, it, it was horrendous. She was sticking her hand into boxes of snakes to, yeah. to get these stars and things. And in the very first one, she was bitten 
by a snake um, and yanked her hand out of this box and the snake came flying out with her hand attached to her finger and uh, skidded across the floor and the first thing she said when she came out was is the snake all right yeah no, well that's emily that is emily uh, she's a oh, she's it's, a, it's just extraordinary i would be <laughs> clubbing that thing I, around I the think head. There are many people who might might be less charitable about the state oh, of God, the snake's yeah. health. Yeah. Uh, but the, uh, the snake wouldn't have any health after it bitten me. No, well, uh, I, mean, I mean, it's lovely to hear you say that because, uh, as I say, you know, you, 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 I'm wildly biased. You know, uh, the, the Sunday before she she went, she was having roast dinner at our up, <laughs> up the road, saying, "What's going to happen? What's going to happen?" When we're saying, "Don't worry about it. Just take a deep breath, and get on, yeah. uh, and, and be brave." So she, she's doing it. So it's a long way to go yet. So uh, I. I'm, I'm I just hope every, she and everyone there yeah. enjoys themselves, and and they they get they get a bit of food. <laughs> well, yes, I hope so. I, mean, I remember working with her a few years back on um, one of the adaptations, one of my books that you were doing involved yes, with, and course, she was, yes. um, yeah, absolutely lovely. Um, 100% uh, diamond so uh, yeah we're very much team Emily on Parts in Crime and hopefully once uh, she's out having been crowned Queen of the Jungle of course um, hopefully um, once things have died down a little bit we might be able to get her on to talk about her experience well maybe we should get someone like Val McDermott and, and, and Emily on the same show the Queen of the Jungle and the Queen of Crime that would be good yeah and no snakes. And no... Well, not unless Val wants to work it into one of her plots. Well, <laughs> she'll be running out of ideas by now, hasn't she? It's, it, it can't be far down the list. <laughs> I, I doubt if she is. <laughs> right, so... Um, back to crime. Uh, back, we, we, to, back to crime. We got a mention of Val McDermott, and we kept it on, on topic, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we, we, we get a little electric buzz through her chair if we've been yeah. not talking about crime. It's Kobo uh, sitting for, there in for Toronto. For five minutes, you get a sort of rather nasty electric <laughs> shock. It's, uh, it's, it's a, a design that's come straight from the guy who does the jungle. It's, it's, uh, it's the head of Kobo exactly. sitting there in Toronto going, right, 30 seconds. <laughs> Where the hell's a crime gun? Um, OK, well, I've got... Uh, first of all, one of the things coming back from Gibraltar, I'm going to clap my hands there if you wonder what that noise is, <laughs> um, uh, Lucy Atkins, who will be known to uh, many crime readers, uh, was over there giving a, a fascinating talk uh, about suspense in, cri in, a, uh, in crime and psychological uh, novels. Now, Lucy Atkins, if you don't know, is an award winning British author and journalist. Her novels, The Night Visitor, The Other Child and The Missing One, are all published by Quirkus. She's also written seven non-fiction books, two of which have won national awards. Um, and uh, all her books are published, of course, internationally. Uh, Lucy has a background in literature and feature journalism. We find that with an awful lot of uh, crime writers, don't we? That they've come we from do. journalism and uh, head -butted other my mic there, so how do you sound effects? Was that, yeah, we're making lots of sort of, there's lots of ambient noises. We are. Uh, going on here we, we can tell I come back into the studio after two weeks and all hell lets loose <laughs> um, anyway she judged the cost of book awards in 2017 um, so she's no lightweight and is a book critic for the Sunday Times and uh, contributes to lots of the Guardian the Times Sunday Times Telegraph Psychologist you name it she's written uh, uh, for them uh, she regularly talks at Cheltenham Literature Festival and the Oxford Festival anyway the gist of this is she knows her onions <laughs> and uh, uh, I'm going to talk uh, about uh, uh, one of her books, which I, was recommended to me by uh, someone before I even went, which is The Night Visitor. Um, it's Claire McIntosh describes it as truly sensational, such a sophisticated, layered read. I absolutely reveled in it. A wonderful, wonderful, too wonderful book. The plotting is superb, but the real triumph is the characterization. The moment I finished, I wanted to read it all over again. So that's Claire McIntosh. The plot is a high flying TV presenter and historian, Professor Olivia Sweetman, stands before an adoring crowd at the launch of her new bestseller. She can barely pretend to smile. Her life has spiralled into deceit, and if the truth comes out, she'll lose everything. Only one person knows what Olivia has done. Vivian Tester is a socially awkward housekeeper of a Sussex manor who has become Olivia's unofficial research assistant. But Vivian has her own secrets. That's the night visitor. That's mm -hmm. quite, yes. What would you do to protect your own reputation? 
uh, that's well, that, 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 that's what not you got, have started with. Not got much to lose. So, uh, uh, well, uh, well, 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 you say that. <laughs> um, so, uh, a fascinating read and a, a fascinating um, uh, crime writer, psychological crime writer. Um, uh, mm. So, I would recommend that book. As I say, there are three out there, uh, but the one I know is the, the Night Visitor, and I agree with uh, Claire McIntosh's review of it absolutely. The others are the Other Child and the Missing One. Lucy Atkins, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. And of course you should get that book and any others you're interested in from Kobo um, the very kind and generous sponsors of the Partners in Crime podcast and as a listener to Partners in Crime you're eligible for a pretty huge 90% discount off of your first ebook purchase with them head to kobo.com k-o-b-o dot com and find the book that you're interested in and if you enter the promo code crime at the checkout then um, yes 90% off is yours Right, moving swiftly on to something you can't as yet get uh, uh, on Kobo, but maybe one day. Um, I'm w- watching a French crime series. You do surprise me. Yeah, uh, uh, well, there we go. I mean, uh, I do like my French. I like my my noirs, my Scandi mm. noirs, my French noirs, my Liechtenstein noirs. Is there <laughs> Liechtenstein noir? I'm sure there probably is. There will be. Yes. Um, anyway, uh, it's called Killer by the Lake. Now, some of you may be uh, uh, following this. It's on Channel Four. Uh, they're st- uh, in the UK. It's Walter. I think is uh, is the platform, but it comes under Channel Four, um, and I'm hoping that it's uh, available around the world. This is the second series. Uh, the first uh, series uh, was called Vanished by the Lake, um, and dealt with the same characters, uh, but uh, it was set in Provence. Uh, it has now moved uh, to another part of France, and the leading actress uh, playing. Uh, uh, in it has also changed. Lise is a homicide detective. Anyway, it's set now on Lake Annecy, which uh, I pride my, myself with having pretty good geography, uh, but in this case I hadn't heard of Lake Annecy, no, which is the third largest lake in France. There we are. That's one for the pub quiz. <laughs> um, uh, it has medieval town, uh, it has a chateau, it has beaches, and it also has a serial killer on the loose. It was sounding quite good until then. Yeah. <laughs> well, yes, well, you can't go anywhere these days, can you, without a, 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 a serial killer, certainly not in fiction. Um, it's, of course, a noirish French thriller. Um, and uh, I watched the first one and I thought, no, I, I don't want to watch this because there were flashbacks to the first one, which I hadn't seen, Vanished by the Lake. Um, and I thought, well, I have, I'm going to watch other things. There's so much competition for th- to, to, to watch so many different things at the moment. I thought, I'll, I'll stop it. But I came back to it one evening, and I'm very, very, very glad I did because it has a, a terrific uh, a hold. It's atmospheric, wonderfully atmospheric. This is something that the the French do uh, particularly well. And it's a beautiful setting. Uh, Lake Annecy is wonderful. The towns uh, uh, around it are medieval towns with can- canals and old buildings and whatever. Mm. And, um, and it's, 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 it's very, very well done. Um, and basically what, as I say, there is a, um, a, uh, a serial killer who's killing people uh, by using the internet, uh, arranging dates through a, sort of a, one of these internet sort of um lonely hearts sort of things or date um sort of things um everyone knows the name of them I, what tinder is it kinder but i don't know don't, don't, don't ask anyway, me i've, 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 been, I've been, been married for six and a half years hopefully i never will um <laughs> but anyway so uh, that's where the murders are happening and they're happening all around the lake as you'd imagine um and uh, lisa is um played by julia de Bonna, uh is a uh, inspector a, a homicide uh, with the French police, and she is married to uh, her Clovis, who uh, works with her, but she he is a, a detective with the gendarmerie. Um, he is a gendarme. So they come from very different uh, departments, but they work in unison, or you hope they do, because, of course, they have their own personal problems, which begin to unravel as the series goes on as well. Uh, Lise also has um, a mother, uh, who is suffering from Alzheimer's, and that's another subplot, uh, which is very moving and very well done. Um, and so I would recommend this for lovers of uh, Spiral, Spiral, uh, Engrenage. Uh, yes, 
I don't think it is as good as that because I, it is my favourite and I am wildly biased. But it has a lot of the same elements uh, in it. Um, uh, the acting is, is, is very good, the scenery is very good, the suspense is very good, and it keeps you on the edge of your seat because you really want to know what goes on. So linking that to Lucy Atkins and her lectures on suspense, uh, the programme certainly delivers uh, on that particular score. So uh, as I say, it's Killer by the Lake. If you haven't seen the first one, Vanished by the Lake, I'd say don't worry about that. Uh, I've got no intention of watching it. I'm starting from <laughs> uh, from here on in. So don't be distracted by the flashbacks. Uh, they, they, they're, they're, you're not missing anything by not having seen the first one. So catch it if you can. My second recommendation, Killer by the Lake uh, on Channel 4's Water. Mm, for fans of Spiral, which, um, of course, is, is famously the most expensive DVD I ever bought. Is it which, really? Um, did, I, I thought I mentioned this on a, a previous episode. You kept going on about Spiral. Yeah. So I thought, OK, I'll buy the, um, the Blu-ray um, box set, which <laughs> turned up, and um, then I realised I didn't have a functioning Blu-ray player. Ah. So I thought, well, that's something I probably should have. So I'll go out and get one of those, more <laughs> more expense. The Blu-ray player turned up, and it didn't fit in my TV cabinet. It was about an inch too wide. And I thought, well, I've been half thinking about changing the TV cabinet anyway, so I've got a new TV <laughs> cabinet as well. So this spiral box set in total ended up costing me about £600. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what I like to hear. And, uh, uh, and I've watched one episode. Oh, yeah. Have you still not watched no, Spiral? No, this is in about March or April I bought it, and I've, I've watched one episode now. I, so. I don't... But I can't... How can I possibly sit next to you doing this week on week out, even with a two-week break? It was all right. It... <sighs> I mean, it's not it's not one that grabbed me from the very very first episode. Um, I will stick. I will watch it. Go back and watch it again and oh, uh, get you going. But um, yeah, it didn't didn't grab me from the start. It was good. There's nothing wrong with it. It will grab you from the well. If it hasn't grabbed you from the start, then you've got to trust it. The the, the the thing that some people say is that they find the French legal system and police system uh, impenetrable. Oh yeah, I haven't, I haven't got understand. a clue what's going on. Uh, uh, you see, I quite love that. I quite love the fact that you know you you've got the judges popping up left, right, and centre and going no, 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 you can't do this. No, no, you know you got to do that and whatever. Mm. And I, 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 it's different. You know, it, oh, yeah, it, yeah. It is is different. So well, I might have to sort of um, organise an enforced viewing of uh, series one of the Spiral. <laughs> like Clockwork Orange. Well, yeah, but a Pin me bit down like with, uh, pin my eyes open. Well, that bit in uh, King of Comedy where um, <laughs> uh, Jerry Lewis is, is, is kidnapped and taped from the, the bottom. <laughs> that, 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 that'll do it. Just yeah. Little slits for your nose and eyes. That's it. Yeah. Uh, Live and, broadcast on YouTube. Yeah, well, there we are. This is the, That's why I'm, I'm passionate about this series, as listeners probably already know to the, to the point of, 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 of sleep. <laughs> Well, I'll um, okay. I'll give it another go. I certainly don't want to be kidnapped. No, well, not for that. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, that'll probably just about do for this week. I think we've probably caught up, have we? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, what else did I mention? Uh, yeah. No, I think that's probably about it on on this front. You can tell we come into this with a plan, can't you? Yeah. Well, we. we yeah. It's a good I, job we don't just sit down and press record and see what happens. Well, you pressed it, then I wasn't even ready for it today. Oh, well, no, exactly. So it's even yeah. less prepared than that. I mean, that could have been a disaster, especially if we'd been live. <laughs> but uh, uh, but we're not. Um, although it feels live when I listen to it. I listen to these occasionally back for a couple of minutes here and there, and I get completely fed up with my voice droning on well, and that's on. That's because we don't take anything out. If things go wrong, if I headbutt the microphone, we, we I keep it all in. It's it's part of the atmos. Oh, is that what so, it is? Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I thought you were headbutting that, that for, for, for on purpose. No, we no. are just this unprofessional. So what have, we got, what have we got coming up? We don't know, do we? Not a clue. We haven't got a clue. This is the way we like it. We're going to have lots of... We're going to have a meeting now, uh, for those of you who uh, haven't actually turned off. Which is Bob's uh, way of getting more coffee out of me. Uh, it is. Well, he does make a damn good coffee, but we've been there before as well. Um, and so we've got a, a long list of uh, guests coming up, uh, which... Uh, it's not necessarily in the right order. Which No, exactly. So we're going to have a, cu a couple of specials coming up before Christmas mm. to go into the... Well, we are in the festive zone. The Christmas trees are up. The lights are up in in the local town uh, in Amtel this year they look particularly spectacular I have to mm. say um, 
We haven't got our Christmas tree yet, but we'll probably do that next week. My, yeah, mine will probably be going up next week or the week after. Let's wait for a new carpet to go in the living room. I'm not going to um, put a Christmas tree up and then oh, try it. to manoeuvre around that for the carpet. Can anyone listeners out there, here we are, I'm going to put out a request now. Uh, Adam won't thank me because he's the one who has to deal with all the emails and stuff <laughs> like that. But does any can anyone recommend a good Christmas murder mystery mm. uh, 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 by uh, an author? Something that we can recommend to our listeners and read ourselves something that has uh, the festive currents running through it and um, all the usual uh, intrigue and um, diabolical qualities of an excellent thriller or murder mystery I was trying to think of a um, a famous murder mystery title with a Christmas pun but my brain's not on that plane this morning no is that uh, m- m- murder in the grotto murder in santa's grotto that'll absolutely do it i've, yeah. I've seen people wanting to commit murder in santa's grotto <laughs> where are we <laughs> end of occasion. november i might just about manage to squeeze a short story out. parents rushing in to say why you haven't given my child what he wanted yeah yes. yeah got all that to look forward to i'm going to take my little one up to uh, up to see santa in the next week or two i'm sure well mine aren't little anymore but they still want to go Mm. That's not right, isn't it? You shouldn't be taking 18, 16, 15-year-olds to, to Santa's well, Maybe you should. How else are they going to get a selfie for Instagram with Santa? That's that's true. Well, I haven't got my beard this year, so they could have done it with me. Mm. Well, right. I've just shaved mine half off. So, uh, When I say half off, I don't mean literally like one half of it. I mean, I've taken it down by half. Oh, I used to do that when I used to grow a beard. Mm. I used to shave half of it off and walk around for most of the day just to see how much people d- t- t- <laughs> notice them. It's a very dis- well, it was for me, a very depressing experience because <laughs> usually I didn't get a raised eyebrow till halfway through the afternoon. There's something wrong with your face, Dad. Um, well, I did so- like your moustache that you had when you were doing Dr. Watson. Oh, yeah. Was, uh... Yes, I should do. Well, Amy doesn't like a moustache. Mm. Let's not go there. Um, <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> Uh, yes, <laughs> facial hair. No, yeah. she, she, she prefers no facial hair, and uh, I listened to my wife. My wife told me that, and I first time I grew a beard was for a play I was in, and I grew it for that, and um, she suddenly decided that she liked it, and I've subsequently, this was about four years ago, I've now not been allowed to shave it off. Uh-huh. So it's gone completely the opposite way. The only use I really have for beards is in, in, in characters. When they've committed a crime and they have a great big uh, beard mm. and lots of hair, and of course they shave a lot off mm. to avoid detection. Uh, Very handy for storing bits of food for later as well. Yeah, well, I, well, we've got Brexit. We'll be having to store food in all sorts of different ways, and, <laughs> and that's probably one of the more novel ones. Well, I've, I've got four cans of chickpeas in here. So we could go for months on 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 Adam's beard, <laughs> McDonald's, Nando's. <laughs> Well, uh, just doing my bit for Britain, Bob. Yeah, That's right. what it is, doing my bit for the country. Well, on that patriotic note, uh, um, uh, let us I think that will finish us off for this week. Yeah, I think we should probably stop there. Yeah, bye. Partners in Crime was presented by Adam Croft and Robert Dawes and produced by Adam Croft. The theme tune was by the Caesarians. The Partners in Crime logo and imagery were designed by Stuart Bache. Partners in Crime is sponsored by Kobo, your favourite local bookshop, perfected. Perfected.